So Vanguard, welcome back to day two of Spiritual Enrichment. And again, we just want to thank you for making the time, taking the time, investing the time to uh, meet together, engage in the scriptures, talk together, and be able to pray together. And just we're really, really glad. And so in your groups yesterday, we had three questions to respond to. And as we begin day two, I'm going to ask uh, Pastor Michael and Pastor Ange um, to respond to that third question. So the third question was this, practically, in real time, what will it look like day to day? What does it look like day to day to be looking into Jesus, the founder and perfecter of your faith? So Pastor Ange, what does it look like practically in your life? Practically, it's um, looking to him in even the smallest of things. Uh, there's things that just come up in the day that you're like, oh, I just need some guidance and wisdom. Um, and it's taking time to pause and say, okay, Lord, help me with this. Um, taking time to go to the Word um, and just seeking His wisdom, His guidance in the day. And, and not just leaving it that, okay, i got to wait till my devotions, my prayer time. Um, but making it continually throughout the day. Mm. God, I look to you because you're where my help come from. Cool. Yeah. Mm. Pastor Michael? Yeah. For, for me, I think echoing what uh, Pastor Ron said, um, just this morning, or well, last night now this morning, I sat in my office, I turned on some worship music, and I was sitting and I was just taken by the goodness of God. Mm. And so for me, day to day, it means taking my eyes off my problems and putting my eyes onto Jesus. Mm. It's not giving mental capacity for all of my issues, but saying instead, hey, I'm just, I'm just going to focus on God. I'm, I'm just going to read his word. I'm going to, to listen to music. I'm going to, to spend time in prayer and just redirect my focus and my energy. Mm. Right. Um, and... Uh, and man, I tell you, it, you come out of those times and you, there's just a refreshing mm. and, a, and a strength to push on. Mm. And I think we all testify the fact that when, we're, when we have those moments or seasons where we stop doing that, you feel the weight of what you're pushing against so much more, and then you know something's lacking in your life. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, just one more thought, too. The first question, or the, the second question I asked was, what weight can weigh you down and trip you up? And I found myself thinking about Psalm 139, because at the end of the psalm, the psalmist says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any grievous way in me, and lead me the way of everlasting. And without going through the whole psalm, but the whole psalm is about how God does know us, and he watches over us. But at the end, he describes a group of people who are just, they're not godly-minded, and they're after doing things their own way and their own strength. And the psalmist says, God, guard my heart from just doing this myself. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's the one the way that I think about, that I don't want to be that kind of person who's just trying to do it myself. In the middle of a pandemic, we need God, mm -hmm. and that helps to lead us towards endurance. So, mm -hmm. so thanks for sharing. Thank you for talking in your groups. And day two, we move now into uh, the book of James, and Pastor Michael is going to be sharing and teaching with us. So open your hearts and get ready to participate. Well, here we are. Uh, session two of Spiritual Enrichment uh, Week. I trust that uh, you enjoyed session one and uh, that uh, God spoke to you. You heard some things and uh, you're taking some steps in obedience uh, with that. Uh, well, today we're going to jump into James, James chapter one, focusing on verses two to four. So let's dive right in. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you be, may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. It's short, it's sweet, it's profound, and it can be life-changing. So there's three things that I want to pull out of uh, what James is writing and what James is talking about there. So the first is this. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. And my first question is, what? Pure joy? Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds? I don't know about you, but when I come into trials and I'm facing trials and obstacles and things like that, the last thing on my mind is, man, this is the best time ever. I don't typically have a lot of joy 
in my life when I come to trials. And yet here's James writing that we need to consider it pure joy when we face these trials of many kinds. The other thing that I notice about what James is talking about is he says when, not if. See, the suffering and the trials and the things that come in life are not a possibility, they're an inevitability. They will happen. If they're not happening right now, they will, and they probably already have. We will face trials, and and James is saying that when we face these trials, we should consider them pure joy. See, suffering is a part of life that we can't get around. Sometimes we get these sufferings because of things that we've done, decisions or choices that we've made that cause suffering. Sometimes it's because of choices and decisions others have made that will cause us suffering. And sometimes things just happen. You get that doctor's report you weren't expecting. Car accident. Many things that can just happen. And so, as James tells us, we will have suffering. He begins by saying, consider it pure joy. Well, why? Why should we consider suffering pure joy? I mean, it doesn't make any sense. Joy in the suffering, joy in and around it. Um, It doesn't make any sense. So why is this? Well, he goes on to say this. Because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Hmm. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face many uh, kinds of trials, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance, the ability to press through. The ability to continue on. The ability to lean in. The ability to... Make it. And as James Wright, it seems that it's by the testing of our faith, it's by these trials and sufferings of many kinds, that that is what produces perseverance, the ability to press through. That's why we should be joyful. We all want our faith to grow. We all want to have a strong, robust faith, but how does that happen? You see, the trials and the suffering that we go through has a purpose. We may not always understand it, but it seems strange to me that one of the primary purposes of having our faith shaken is so that our faith may be made unshakable. That's the joy. Not the joy in what we're going through and be like, yay, this is awesome. But the joy deep down in understanding that as we persevere, as we put our trust and lift our eyes from our circumstances to the face of Jesus, our faith will grow. You see, faith is a lot like muscle tissue. If you stress it to the limit, it gets stronger not weaker. That's what James is talking about here. Consider it pure joy when the testing, uh, when you receive trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. When your faith is threatened and tested and stretched to the breaking point, the result is a greater capacity to endure. He later calls this steadfastness. I was reading an article from Harvard Health, Um, and in there, a a physiotherapist named David Nolan describes this. He says, a lot of people don't understand that stretching has to happen on a regular basis, and it should be done daily. It goes on to say that stretching keeps the muscles flexible, strong, and healthy, and we need that flexibility to maintain a range of motion in the joints. Without it, the muscles shorten and become tight. Then, when you call on the muscles for activity, they are weak and unable to extend all the way. That puts you at risk of joint pain, strains, and muscle damage. What an incredible 
illustration and picture of our faith, our faith muscle. I mean, I'm no bodybuilder, obviously, but talking with some and kind of hearing a little bit about it and knowing a little bit about how to build muscle, what happens is, is when you go to the gym and you're working out, your muscle needs to be torn and then, it, and then muscle grows in the places where it's torn, thus making the muscle bigger and making it stronger. Faith is the same way. The way we grow our faith is by using the faith we do have. Some people get ripped in the gym, but I want to have ripped faith. I want to be strong in my faith. You can hashtag that, hashtag ripped faith. But you want to have a faith that's strong, a faith that's robust, a faith that endures. And the way that that happens is by when we face our trials of many kinds, it tests our faith and it develops perseverance. That's where the joy part comes in because we know that that's growing our faith. Well, the third part is this. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Be mature and complete. I want you to take a moment and think of some individuals in your life, some men and some women in your life that you would consider to be pillars of the faith, strong Christians, strong believers, robust faith. Picture them in your mind now. What do you think took for these people to get to that point of faith in their life? I think one of the things, if you were to ask any one of them, one of the things that would come up is the choice that they make through trials. Every single one of those people who has a robust faith has gone through suffering has persevered, who's pressed through and pressed on through suffering and the trials and has persevered and their faith has grown. Every single one of those people would tell you that their faith is only as strong as it is because of the journey that they've been on. Their faith has grown because the faith they have had, they've used. That's why we consider it a pure joy. Because it's by the testing of our faith produces perseverance. I want to tell you a story. Horatio was a successful lawyer and businessman in Chicago. With a lovely family, a wife Anna, and five children. However, there were no strangers to tears and tragedy. Their young son died of pneumonia. And that same year, much of their business had been destroyed by a fire. A few years later, Horatio's wife Anna and their four daughters set sail on a ship to travel from Chicago to Europe. Horatio had originally planned to go with his family, but because of some unexpected business problems, he told his wife that he would join her and the children in Europe a few days later. His plan was to catch the next ship. About four days into the crossing, of the Atlantic, the ship collided with another. Suddenly, all those on board were in grave danger. Anna rushed her four children to the deck. She knelt there with Annie, Margaret Lee, Bessie, and Tanita, and prayed that God would spare them or to make them willing to endure whatever awaited them. Within approximately 12 minutes, the ship slipped beneath the dark waters of the Atlantic, carrying with it 226 of its over 300 passengers, including the four children of Horatio and Anna. A sailor, rowing a small boat over to the spot where the ship went down, spotted a woman floating on a piece of the wreckage. It was Anna still alive, he pulled her into the boat and they were picked up by another ship. Nine days later, they landed in Wales. From there, 
Anna contacted her husband and sent a message to him which began, Saved alone, what should I do? Another of the ship's survivors later recalled Anna saying, God gave me four daughters. Now they've been taken from me. Someday I will understand why. Horatio booked himself on the next available ship and left to join his grieving wife. With the ship about four days out, the captain called him into his cabin and told him that they were over the place where his children had drowned. Horatio then wrote, It is well with my soul.
have a choice. We can't control the circumstances we find ourselves in. But we can control how we will respond to them. How will you choose to respond to the trials and suffering in life? How will you choose to respond with whatever life seems to throw your way? What will your choice reveal about your heart, about your faith, and about your trust in the goodness of God? Do you trust Him? Is your faith strong enough to withstand whatever comes at you? You have a choice. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything.